Hey guys, welcome back to Anthony's Tennis Hub. My name is Anthony Hirsch. Today I want to do a video talking about Carlos Alcaraz and Yannick Sinner and kind of comparing their careers, comparing their journeys, talking about who they are as players, and also sprinkled into it, I also just want to talk about generally how players' careers can be pretty different from one another and yet they can still achieve a really top result at the end of the day. Um, so first thing I kind of want to talk about is the differences of Yannick Sinner and Carlos Alcaraz. So first of all, both are incredibly aggressive players, right? Um, but Carlos Alcaraz, right as soon as he's come to the tour, everybody is saying he is the most complete 18-year-old, 17-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old we've seen. He has every shot in the book. He has a million options from every position. Um, he's a shot maker, he's a powerhouse, and uh, he he's, has so much variety, and um, he's a shot maker, and he's he just has so many different options, so many different tools, and um, it's crazy. From so many positions in the court, he can hit an incredible shots. Something I always say is Carlos Alcaraz plays video game tennis, which seems to which seems to fit the kind of youthful exuberance and going after crazy shots. They kind of gives out and it's just crazy tennis they can hit from so many different positions in the court um find winners from everywhere i remember a shot against nicholas jari last year in rio where he was the camera couldn't even see him he was in the very corner of the court he did an incredible slide and just a screamer of a winner down the line which was one of the most incredible forehand passing shots i've probably ever seen in my life um echoes of rafa when he was young but yeah, even to that it held a candle really incredible so He's just a shot maker. Yannick, the skills that he possesses have been absolutely clear, and uh, but it, it is a little bit different. I mean, he's had to work on multiple parts of his game, least of which the serve and tinkering the serve. He's had to include more slices, more drop shots, more net play, and just generally just finding the more consistency and um, kind of adding variety into his game. Uh, but... What has happened, in my opinion so far, is that Carlos has absolutely sprinted to the top. He is the youngest world number one uh, ever, and he uh, he got there at about 19 years old. And uh, Yannick, it's taken him a little bit longer. Every single year, his win percentage has improved, right? Um, I believe in about 2021, it was about at about 70%, maybe a little bit lower. 2022, it was about 73%, despite really not having huge showing for like title runs or big upsets or anything, but his consistency was there. And then this last year, over 80% win percentage. So the win percentage only keeps climbing up. Yannick Sinner is actually the only example of a player I've ever seen he has a winning record every single year he stepped on the tour. He's been very good, very young, just not quite like Alcaraz, but he's been steadily improving. And uh, we kind of saw, saw it all burst out. It kind of started with, you could argue, well, pretty much all of last year, he was playing at a very top level, um, especially after Australia, after the Australian Open, where he uh, nearly came back from two sets slowed down against Tsitsipas, but Tsitsipas played, kind of went away in the fifth set, and Tsitsipas kind of raised his level. Uh, but at Rotterdam, he beat Steph. He got a title in Montpellier. He, uh, he got to three consecutive Masters semifinals, including a great win over defending champion Fritz, who always seems to pick his game up in, in Indian Wells and from the home crowd. Um, and, uh, it was a really big epic there. Great win for Yannick playing on a high level, finally being a top five guy, finally be winning in a Masters quarterfinal. And then, uh, then Miami. Uh, one of the best performances, if not the best, I've seen from Yannick in a match against Rublev in the quarters. Then his first win over world number one, the semis. Uh, and then Monte Carlo. But, and then it was the Wimbledon semi, then the Canada win, which really unlocked something in Yannick. And then post US Open, he just won on an absolute sprint. Two wins over Novak. I believe eight consecutive wins over top five guys. Like the numbers were just ridiculous. Maybe five or six consecutive wins over top five guys. And I think, about 10 consecutive wins over top 10, some crazy like that. So Yannick was started playing amazing. So it's really been kind of a build up to this kind of sprint where he's just been tinkering and tinkering, figuring things out. And even on the physical side as well, he's had to figure it out. Carlos, what does he need to figure out, right? He's been, per, he's one the most complete player you've ever seen at 20 years old. 
He's won Wimbledon. He's won the U.S. Open. He's already, like I said, already been world number one. He's got all the tools. Well, he's got a lot to figure out. And uh, he's only 20 years old. I don't think he's at his peak yet. And what really Carlos needs to figure out is figuring out when to peak his game is one thing. Figuring out how to use all the tools at his disposal. And what I mean by when to peak his game is that it's amazing that Carlos possesses this kind of, you could say, top quality of going after ball after ball. And that's that's what you want out of a player. Even in, if they're in a losing position, to have that kind of mental instinct to just chase after balls. And it's it's not to say that you think you're going to hit a winner when you get there or you think you're going to get win the point, but it's to say that you have that kind of work ethic and that drive inside and you want you want to prove it to yourself that you can that you can get there to that ball and you want to only get better and better and better for yourself, not for anybody else, not for any other reason, but just bring the best out of yourself. I think Carlos has that, which is great. That's what helped him win at Wimbledon. But what he needs to figure out how to do is when you're playing a five-set match, a physical match, you need to figure out how to really taper your game, taper your running, figure out exactly when you want to peak in a game. Because right now, Carlos is all peak. And what has also happened is Carlos has really dropped his level post around September, October every year because he's just full-on sprint and then he runs out of gas a little bit. So those are a few things with Carlos that he needs to figure out, but... He kind of did a sprint and now he needs to figure out exactly like these kind of ins and outs of how to make everything kind of work. Yannick, on the other end, he's been consistent, but he's been steadily improving. And now it's just an absolute sprint for him at the moment, which either way works. I mean, you you look at guys like the big three, right? And (laughs) now it's not like regular players, right? We look at them as icons, like perfect players who never struggled. It's not true. (laughs) It's far from true. Look at Rafa, right? Rafa, the most consistent player, always at the top, pretty much ever. He is the definition of struggle. Rafa has struggled. He has gone through injury after injury after injury and always managed to come back. That's the thing, right? And he struggled on hard courts. He was losing straight forward on hard courts against guys like Fernando Gonzalez beat him in straight sets in Australia. Juan Martín del Potro beat him 6-2, 6-2, 6-2. At the U.S. Open, he came back the next year, he won the title. He lost to Sanga, I believe, 6-2, 6-3, 6-2. Came back the next year, won the Australian Open against uh, prime Roger Federer in five sets. Uh, so they struggled. Roger struggled. He was way out of it as a junior, but he would, he found, okay, you know what? I have a lot of talent. I got a lot of heart, a lot of fight. I've got a great winner's mentality. I'll figure this out. I'm going to, I'm going to stop kind of wasting my talent. I'm going to figure this out. And, uh, he did. And he went on an absolute sprint. Novak, also the definition of struggle. Um, not, uh, least of which for one is that he had, he, he was a jokester of the tour. He was the guy that was making kind of jokes and pranks and express impressions of other players. He was the perennial number three in the world. People thought he would never catch up to Novak and Roger. I mean, this guy who was struggling physically, retiring out of matches, drop shotting so much on his backhand and missing a lot of them, not doing real well. He had the highest double fault ta- uh, stat, I think in 2009 or 2010, double faulting like crazy. The serve wasn't there. Kind of weird form on his forehand and his backhand, but he did it. Novak worked hard and he did it. He physically, he became an absolute beast. And he looked at every single part of his physicality to figure it out. He, Roger and Rafa make, made Novak better. They made Novak better. So I'm going on a bit of a big three tangent here, but I think it's important also to look at these guys to also look at Sinner and Alcaraz. You can look at people in the past as well and talk about their journeys. Um, one is interesting, a Bjorn Borg, who went on an absolute sprint and pretty much retired as soon as he dropped off from world number one. But if, I think it's a good comparison, the big three to, uh, to Sinner and Alcaraz. So you have Novak, who was forced to get better by Rafa and Roger, and especially by Roger. I mean, Roger, when Novak came, he was at the top. Roger showed Novak what he can do. We've still never seen a dominance like the one that Roger had from about 2004, 2008, uh, where he reached 36 consecutive Grand Slam quarterfinals, 23 consecutive Grand Slam semifinals. He reached 10 consecutive Grand Slam finals, and then he missed one 
And then he reached eight more. He reached 18 Grand Slam finals in 19 consecutive Grand Slams played. That is a real style that's unbelievable. Uh, and it says, you can say weak era. It's In any era, if you can dominate at the highest level of one of the most fine margin, difficult sports, that says more about the player dominating uh, than it does about the rest of the tour. Because let's be realistic. These are the highest level athletes in the world. If you're able to dominate like that, it says something more about Roger then. It says something more about Novak now. When some people say weak era, it says more about them. Um so Roger was absolutely insane. We we still have never seen a dominance like that for about four or five years. And uh, Novak saw how a player can dominate. Roger forced him to get better in a lot of their matches, and he also, um, and uh, he also showed Novak the longevity that he had because Roger had this incredible sprint, and then pretty much everybody was like, "Wow, he's like the greatest of all time." But surely he's done now. No, nope, he still was able to beat and compete with Rafa and, Rafa and Novak, two of the greatest players ever, and push them to their best for a long time still. With some amazing longevity, he was still in great tight Grand Slam finals against Novak, 2014 Wimbledon, 2015 Wimbledon, 2015 US Open. He won the 2012 Wimbledon into his 30s. It was longevity that was unprecedented. I mean, he, Roger is the guy who really started up this insane longevity in tennis where he can be at the top. He's still the oldest world number one ever, the second oldest Grand Slam champion ever, and uh, got one point away from beating Novak at Wimbledon at like 38. But even outside of that, I mean, just incredible longevity. He showed Novak what he can do with longevity, and Novak has said that as well. So it's these guys like Rafa, and they've all struggled hugely. But I would say Rafa's career has been more of a marathon. He's just kind of been at the top a lot. Novak's has been a bit of a sprint because he was struggling so much at the start, kind of the number three. Starting from about 2011, he just won on an absolute sprint of it. And I say about how Federer inspired Novak. One of the most underrated moments, in my opinion, of the last little bit of tennis. 2010 U.S. Open semifinal, overshadowed by 2011 U.S. Open, overshadowed by 2019 Wimbledon final. But what it is was... In my opinion, the biggest and most impressive win of Novak's career to that date. He was down two sets to one against Roger. He uh, he was down two match points with incredible, assertive, serve and volley winner, uh, or sorry, not serve and volley winner, swing and volley winner to save match point. Um, he didn't even reach a Masters final that year, let alone a Grand Slam final that year. He was kind of struggling in 2010, even though he kept getting close. He lost a lot of matches to Federer, especially in the Masters, but... He, uh, he got over the line in that one. And once he got over the line with that absolutely huge win over Federer, which he wasn't winning a whole lot against Federer at that time at all, just wide eyed. He's like, wow, I kind of unlocked something that I didn't see. He was just wide eyed, staring at the crowd for about 10 minutes. I think what was in his head was, I feel like I've unlocked potential that I haven't seen before. And I don't know if there's a lot of other things with it. One is the serve, one is the physicality. There's so many things you can mention that helped Novak in 2011. But I do think that that's an underrated piece of the puzzle. I think that win over Roger really gave Novak a whole lot of confidence moving forward. And we surely wouldn't have had the 2011 U.S. Open comeback if we didn't have the one in 2010. Uh, it gave Novak a lot of confidence. But they all force each other to be better, just like I hope that Sinner and Alcaraz will force each other to be better. I'll talk about Sinner and Alcaraz's career so far, but first about the big three. Rafa's was more of a marathon, kind of always at the top, always there. Well, not always there. He really had to figure it out. <laughs> On hard courts, on grass courts, losing the Wimbledon finals to Federer. And then he was always struggling with injury, but he always found a way to be in the top 10. 912 consecutive weeks of top 10. That doesn't even include the frozen pandemic weeks, which could have made it about 934. But either way, over 900 weeks at top 10, he was always there. Novak's was more of a sprint. He really was struggling until 2011. Then he kind of sprint, sprinted out from there with just sensational time. He's been dominating for like the last part of it, he's improved all of those weakness that, uh, weaknesses that I said. He's been improving a part of, upon every single one of those while remaining incredibly athletically impressive, even at 36, almost 37. He's above average athletically and physically for the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the tour. He's worked hard and pretty much perfected and crafted, uh, the rest of his game around it. He's always been so adaptable and he's ever improving on the volley, off the forehand, off the serve. I said it in another video, I think, but, he, his forehand, he was hitting it about as good as I saw pretty much 
all last year. His sir, he was volleying about as well as I've ever seen him in Cincinnati and U.S. Open. And he was serving as good as I've seen him at the ATP Finals, especially in the final of the ATP Finals against Sinner. So Novak ever improving every part of his game while remaining incredibly physically impressive, which has let him dominate like he has for such a long period of time, um, which is really incredible, even a scientific achievement to be able to dominate in tennis the way that Novak has for such a long, long game period of time, with only a pause of like 2017, 2018 for parts of those years. Uh, Roger... To me, it was like a sprint, and then he was a marathon. 38 years old, beating Novak in straight sets at the ATP Finals. He was still playing what great tennis at Wimbledon in 2021 at almost 40. This is stuff that had never been done before. He was, surely in 2008, 2004, 2008, Roger did not expect that he would be around, maybe even around at 36, let alone world number one at 36. This is a guy who stayed around for a long, long time, but at the start, it was really like a sprint. For an absolute sprint, like I said, insane dominance. For me, Roger's like a sprint and then a marathon. Nadal's like a marathon. Novak's just been an absolute sprint since around 2011. And since 2018 as well, he's won 12 of the last 19 majors he's competed in, has Djokovic. So why do I mention the big three and kind of their journeys? Well, we talk about Sinner and Alcaraz. What are their journeys? Well, another player who's playing right now, Medvedev, another pretty young player. He has an interesting journey. Medvedev started out a pretty offensive player. He had really weird form on his strokes. He was outside the top 30, 40, 50 in the world until he was about 22, 23. People really didn't expect that much more of him. But he he decided to take a big risk with, risk with his game and playing in a very unorthodox way. But it started feeling much better to him playing defensive, way behind the baseline, much more uh, st- uh, strategy in his game. And he's really climbed up, which is a really unique kind of thing. Now he's reached five Grand Slam finals. I mean, that is a really absurd kind of trajectory. Alcraft's trajectory, just a sprint. I mean, he, just a sprint. Now he's figuring out the ins and outs. Sin, uh, Sinner has been more of like just ever consistently improving. And it's the thing of this. This is another point that, I'm, that uh, I kind of want to get out in this video is that it's not always obvious. It's not the people who have the most perfect game or who have the most perfect start or face the least kind of problems in their career. Offense, the people have a lot of struggles and a lot of things to figure out who do well. And you see that with a guy like Rafa physically. You see that with a guy like Novak, who was struggling just about every way early on, least of which because of his rivals were nearly impossible to beat. And then you, you see a guy like Roger, who really was struggling in many ways uh, at the start of his career. He decided to be a bit of a fiery junior, complete opposite of that for the rest of his career. And Yannick, Yannick says that he looks at his matches as he doesn't really mind if he wins or loses. It's uh, he he just wants to be doing the right general steps forward for his career as a whole, not just for 2024, 2023, but for 2025, 2026. That's really what Novak did as well. He was looking at how to improve in the grand scheme of things. I think there's something big and important about that. But Carlos also incredible win percentage, ridiculously mentally solid player, and they're both so humble and willing to improve. I really think that that is going to really help them, even though they're really contrasting in what their journeys have been so far. Center just consistent, consistent, but really not quite there, but finally now figure it out and really bust open like Novak did when he was struggling a lot then in 2011. Carlos sprinted there, and now he's having a few issues having to figure things out, how to use all the tools he has. Center is adding tools. But it's just these journeys of different players. And Sinner, Yannick Sinner, on June 1st, 2023, his stakes, his stock in Yannick Sinner was really never that much lower because he had just lost the second round to Altmaier. He had a match point. Um, he was kind of losing matches ever since Monte Carlo. You know, people thought, is he going to be able to finish against these top guys? Is he going to be able to do it on clay courts, all this, all that? He's still struggling physically in the best of five. There are so many concerns on him. On Yannick, his serve really wasn't there. But end of this year, a lot of people said he had one of the best years of any player of the year. So it's really, it's really not about the struggles that a player faces. It's about are they humble? Are they willing to improve? Are they really mentally strong? Are they passionate about the game and wanting to climb up in the rankings? And really, are <laughs> the talent levels of the players as well is important to look at. And Yannick's always been talented, even if the serve hasn't quite been there or this or that, or the variety of talent has been clear. So sometimes you have to look a little bit more under the surface with these players, like a guy like Novak, 
who really shouldn't have done all the things he did, but he figured it out. He worked hard. So um, it's unpredictable. It's a little bit unpredictable, and I'm excited to see where their trajectories go from here. I kind of want to talk about Center Alcaraz, their comparisons. They have a crazy rivalry, really great rivalry between Center Alcaraz. That's one of my personal favorites. I mean, um, I can talk about that as well. Yannick really needs to play his most creative best with a lot of variety if he wants to beat Carlos. Carlos needs to really find a way, once he's being pushed by a big hitter like Yannick, that's a kind of his weakness, find a way to get, have, to play fast, play into the court, get the aggression, get play good uh, improvisation. It's really good kind of young, fresh, shot-making tennis, just at its best, very inventive, and it, it's so fun to watch these guys kind of push each other to their best. But... uh it will be interesting to see how they push each other, where they grow from here. And uh, Medvedev as well, who I mentioned as well. It's going to be interesting to see how all of them grow. And you also look at a guy like Holger Runa and a guy, other guys. They're still young, still inexperienced. I just say, give all of them time. And, uh, for example, last year, Holger Runa on grass courts, he lost every match on grass courts pretty easily. Everybody's like, oh, he can't play on grass courts. I said, give him time. Like, I don't see why he can't play on grass courts. He did really well at fast indoor courts. He has a big serve. I was just like, I don't see why he can't play on cross courts. This year, really great. Beat Dimitrov in the round 16, who's playing really well. And then he went, uh, I believe, four sets against Alcaraz in the quarterfinals, three or four sets. So just give all these guys time on different surfaces to kind of experience. All of them will have different journeys. But if you believe in a player's talent, if you believe in their hard work, wherever their journey is, even if it's very different from each other, they can all end up at the top. At the end of the day, tennis is very unpredictable, which is why, and very small margin as well, which is why you have, a, have to ver have a very strong mentality. And that might be the most important thing to look for. Both Alcaraz and Sinner have that, a very strong kind of mentality on them. And uh, that will really help them out throughout it. And the fact that tennis is so small margins, which what does that mean? That means like a ball hits the net on match point and just dribbles over or dribbles back on your side. It hits the net, it hits the line or not, which is why in tennis, especially at the highest level, you have to work on every single little thing to try to get those small margins to go into your favor, which is something that I absolutely love about tennis. In tennis, every point is a little bit different and there's something crazy about that. And some points matter. Some points cost more than other points. Like a match point costs more than another, than another point in the match. But it's all such small margins, and you have to make sure the physical is working right. You have to make sure all stuff personal in your life is kind of working right. You have to make sure that a million other things that you're working on beforehand to serve to make sure that those small margins in a match are working in your favor. Djokovic did that. He looked at, he's always looks at every small thing. And uh, I know that Yannick and Carlos um, are as uh, dedicated as well to that. But yeah, it's not always the perfect looking tennis player who kind of climbs to the top. Medvedev surely wasn't that. Rafa with his forehand, such a strange forehand, high RPM forehand. He surely wasn't that. But it's these people who kind of work hard and have a great kind of mental side to them often who kind of climb up to the top. And I'm excited to see where Cinder Alcaraz go from here. They have such a fun rivalry. I mean, U.S. Open 2022 is crazy. Uh... And every match they've played so far was unbelievable. I really love their rivalry. It's the thing I'm most excited about in the future of the sport. Um, and I've just been loving their matches from the very start and uh, across all three surfaces as well, including an Umag and a clay final where Yannick beat him 6-1, 6-1, the second and third sets on clay. It's been a really fun rivalry so far. I'm excited to see where they go from here uh, individually and in their head-to-head. -head. center now leading 4-3. And it should be really interesting uh, where they go. I kind of want to talk about in this video where they are in their career so far, comparing their journeys and careers a little bit. And also just about different players' journeys and how it's not always super obvious that a player is going to get to the top of the game. Like Medvedev, people didn't expect it. Novak, people didn't expect would be the greatest of all time when he was having so many different issues, physically retiring with Rafa and, uh, Rafa and Roger. So it's always hard to predict. Players have different journeys, and Cinder and Alcaraz surely have that. I'm excited to see where they go in the future. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to Anthony's Tennis Hub if you enjoyed the video as well. Always fun for me to talk about tennis. I'll be back with more like topical videos, other stuff like that. I'll see you guys at the next video.